in Asia under their emperor, Hirohito. Japan's future moves were of crucial importance. To get this information from Japanese agents in America, Roosevelt's administration set up several wiretap stations which were strictly against federal law. The stations were under the control of the U.S. Navy. One was set up here in the heart of San Francisco. It was on the top floor of 717 Market Street. It was run by Lieutenant Ellsworth Hosmer, an expert in wireless interception. Every morning, he and his assistants would use a door at the back of the building to their secret office. One of the men Hosner recruited was Robert Danforth Ogg, a brilliant electronics undergraduate and navigator. Ogg, without naval training of any kind, was put to work as a government spy. The microphone jobs that we were sent out to do uh, were in the hotels in Chinatown, where they... Japs seem to enjoy having their meetings. I'll reference back that we wiretapped, subsequent to my first one, we wiretapped every known Japanese uh, espionage location uh, really in the 12th Naval District and brought them basically into the central office to record them. So we were recording every Jap spy's uh, phone conversations. I might say one of them... Uh, uh, was involved with the Negro Whorehouse, and some of the names were Arizona and Nevada. <laughs> so it provided some hilarity along the way. But primarily we were uh, either bugging or wiretapping at their homes or bugging their conference meetings. And some of their conference meetings data we would obtain from the wiretaps and uh, go in and uh, arrange a bug before they got their room in the hotel and... Uh, we would go in the basement then and usually record the whatever happened in the rooms up above. In the National Archives in Washington is kept every wartime diplomatic message that passed between Tokyo and Japanese diplomats abroad. American codebreakers built a machine they called Purple to break the Japanese code in 1940, a whole year before Pearl Harbor. The result was that the Americans knew every move the Japanese foreign ministry made from then to the end of the war. Only a handful of Roosevelt staff and top army and navy commanders ever knew of this cryptographic success. For a nation on the brink of war, the information flowing from it was priceless. But what the Americans did not have in 1941 was access to the codes which held the secrets of the powerful Japanese Navy which was growing on the far side of the Pacific. They could intercept, but not decipher, the Japanese naval messages in a code they came to refer to as JN-25. Admiral Isoruko Yamamoto, Commander-in-Chief of the Japanese Combined Fleet, used the JN-25 code for the bulk of his messages. The Americans had tried desperately, but failed to break the code and discover his plans. Yamamoto wanted to show the Japanese nation that the Navy could be as dominant in the Pacific as the Army had been in China. By January 1941, Yamamoto had decided that if war with America was unavoidable, he would strike first by destroying the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. This decision ran counter to the undertakings between Japan, Germany, and Italy in September 1940, when they signed the Tripartite Pact. The three countries set out to defeat and split up the British Empire while denying America an excuse to come into the war. But the final agreement was so worded that Japan would never be dragged unwillingly into war. Yamamoto did not trust Hitler to act in the best interests of Japan. He was aware that Roosevelt was closely watching developments. 
Yamamoto had no intention of allowing some act of war by Germany or Italy to force him to confront the American fleet before he was ready to strike. Two months later, the war between Italy and Great Britain flared up in the Mediterranean. In November 1940, Rear Admiral Arthur Lister of the Royal Navy took the aircraft carrier Illustrious to within 200 miles of the port of Taranto, where the Italian fleet lay at anchor. Under cover of darkness, 21 aircraft attacked the Italian battleships with bombs and torpedoes. Within 30 minutes, the fleet air arm had disabled three battleships and put the Italian fleet out of the war for at least six months. The attack was a graphic example of the kind of damage a seaborne raid could inflict on a war fleet at anchor. Yamamoto must have had Taranto in mind when two months later, January 1941, he decided to attack Pearl Harbor. The following August, three months before Pearl Harbor, a Pan-American clipper took off from Lisbon bound for New York. One of the passengers was a Yugoslavian businessman. The German Secret Service was sending him to America to expand its already extensive spy network. What the Germans didn't know was that the businessman, Dusko Popov, was in fact a double agent employed by the British Secret Service. His code name was Tricycle. Tricycle had shown his British spy masters a fake telegram with a micro dot. It specified the information he was to get for the Germans from America. There were general requests for information about aeroplane production, but Tricycle had also been asked to report on sensitive locations inside the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. In his retirement in France some years ago, Dasko Popov talked about his mission. Germans decided to send me to the United States to organize similar spy nets. And they have given me a lot of questionnaires, uh, the position of the ships, where they harbor the oil field, uh, oil uh, reserves, uh, ammunition depots, and everything objects for immediate bombing about the torpedo nets, the strength of the torpedo nets and uh, all the other things which uh, would involve, which would be necessary for the Japanese to know for an immediate attack and all centered on Pearl Harbor. Tricycle was never allowed to complete his mission. J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, refused to allow the British double agent to operate in his country. But from that moment, Hoover had definite evidence that Pearl Harbor was a target, either for the Germans or the Japanese. In Honolulu, the Japanese consul was also being asked for details of the defenses of Pearl Harbor. These requests were received and dispatched to and from the embassy through an American cable company. As August turned to September, Ensign Takio Yashikawa, the consulate naval spy, sent back to Japan information about the harbor's installations. Roosevelt had also been studying the Pacific. He was concerned by the situation on the mainland of Asia where the Japanese had invaded southern Indochina. The president had countered by imposing an embargo on oil and other materials to Japan. The Dutch East Indies, further south, was the closest alternative source of oil. The San Francisco Naval Wiretap Unit was alerted to pick up Japanese reactions to the embargoes. They were looking for the reaction 
to embargoes, I would say that my memory recalls that we were advised of almost every embargo of any nature that was placed on oil.